Father, thank you for uh, the church, for your bride. And uh, Father, for the incredible privilege of, uh, of being a part of that bride, of, of many of us leading that bride. And Father, as we walk through this session now in, in what renewal means and what does it mean to continue to be the church that you've called us to be, I, I just pray that you would, you know, just lead this time. Uh, Father, that you would speak through Terry and God help us to just think well about what it means to continue to be your bride uh, on this earth to display your glory. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. Thanks, Al. As I said on my video intro, I am interested in church renewal. Um, I, I've been interested in that topic, in that concept, um, not just the concept, but the actual practice of it for a long, long time. Um, and I think it's through my observation of churches that I, I start seeing things and go like, hey, here's, here's a need for, I, I can observe and, and diagnose some situations. It's, it's a bit like, you go to your family doctor, and you know that there's something that's not quite right in your, in your body, but you're not quite sure what it is. So you go to your family doctor, and the doctor says, well, I've, I've got some ideas of what it is. And so they'll, they'll give a diagnosis. And then after that, they'll send you to a specialist who can actually fix you uh, if it's complicated enough. And that's what I am. I am the family doctor here. I am not a specialist. The specialists are the ones who help fix these things. I'm just here to point to these things. It's like John the Baptist. He just says, repent. Uh, and Mark Clark, he's been talking about repentance. And so I'm here to talk about signs, uh, things in our churches that may be flashpoints or signs, that, which when we look at them, we say, you know what, there's, there's perhaps a need for renewal here. But I think what I've seen, and I, I pastored a church for five years in Saskatchewan. That's my expertise. Uh, there's been many who have pastored many more longer years than that. But what I observed in my experience with the church that I pastored then too was that there were some, some signs um, that, that the church needed renewal. And um, I couldn't always put words to it. I didn't always know what I was looking for or what, what was happening. But later on, as I was doing some, some thinking and studying on this, I, I realized that there are actually words for these things, that there are concepts for these things. And so I'm going to give you the theory of it, and then I'll, I'll just send you to the wolves and let you figure it out yourself. I think that's what Mark said this morning anyway. <laughs> uh, you're big enough people. You can do this. Um, so I'm just going to resort to that. No, I, I think that uh, this is where the group wisdom comes in as well, that perhaps we have experienced some things that, that maybe can be a benefit to each other, and hopefully I will help in some of the diagnosis, and then hopefully you can also help each other, and, and maybe we can find some resources together of, of how, to, how to address and respond to those, those needs for renewal. So this is what I promised. Um, this is what I promised you. Uh, the story of the EMMC is a search for renewal through several important stages, and I've seen these stages. The, these are basic life cycle stages of organizations. Um, this is not, well, it is kind of rocket science, but it is also, people have studied organizations for years, and they realize that whether you're a, a church or a business or a nonprofit organization or any kind of group that gets together, there are some natural stages that, that groups go through, and, and you can almost predict at what stage uh, that group will need some refreshment, renewal, and revitalization, and sometimes when you need downright rebirth, uh, you need to be born again. Uh, otherwise, that's it for you. Um, our churches, like ourselves, change through stages of birth, growth, and decline. At each, each stage of the church life, there may be signs of health and potential risks. It doesn't just mean that, that young churches or baby churches have, have all the potential and, and that there's no problems. It, it can go sour in any, any way, shape, or form at any stage in that life cycle. But my interest is the fact that EMMC is 80 years of age. And at 80 years of age, many of our churches are 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 80 years of age. And there are some signs of, uh, there are some predictable signs or things that we can watch out for when we get to certain ages, just like my health. As I'm getting to a certain age, I have to 
have certain kinds of checkups and, and those kinds of things to, to make sure that I stay healthy for my stage of life. Same thing with churches. These risks, if unattended, can lead to slow but certain death. The workshop will explore five stages of church life cycle. Um, there are actually 10 stages, but I'm only giving you five, kind of giving you the brief summary. If you want more detail, I can give you that later. Um, then identify some signs of a healthy church, and then I want to look at a checklist, give you a checklist, and I want you to do a mental checklist of your own church right now. And I will go, I will just ask you some diagnostic questions as to how healthy your church might be. And see how many checks. You can just do it in your mind. I think you, you can count. Uh, this, is a, this is a qualified bunch. We can do this. And, and I'm guessing that by the end, you will be able to tell, at least to, to some extent, how healthy your church is. And then we'll talk about some interventions uh, for, for how to respond to, to churches that are in, in a different stage of life uh, that need some extra assistance. I'm not here just to give you handy tips and tricks on how to fix your church. Um, I am not the church fix-it guy. I am an observer and someone who can maybe help you to give you some tools and some language in which you can talk to your people about the kinds of things you need to do, do or address. Jesus called us to be, Jesus called us to be branches that bear fruit. That was the point uh, that he came for. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless it, you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You get the point? <laughs> but, but it's so easy to, to realize or to forget. We, we go through this and we hear, you know, hear some inspirational talks, but, but the point is bearing fruit, bearing fruit, bearing much fruit. And what do we do with our apple trees or, or our fruit, you know, our bushes or something? Sometimes we have to prune them fairly hard, harshly um, so that they will bear more fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked off, thrown into the fire, and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Bearing fruit. How do we do that? How do we respond by bearing fruit? Um, when I was a, a young pastor, I wished I had known some of these things. Um, I, I felt like, I, I remember I was, I was a youth pastor um, very briefly, um, it is much, I'm not proud of this one, uh, but I was, I was a youth pastor for eight months, all of eight months, and um, I remember getting hired and, and having great enthusiasm for the, for the youth group, and I was going to make some changes, and we were going to do some really amazing stuff, and after eight months, I had my first crisis. Uh, some parents didn't appreciate some of the things that I was doing, and, uh, and I said, well, if that's what you think, I'm leaving. And I just quit. <laughs> I was a spoiled brat, okay? Um, it was just, that was, I should have expected those kinds of things to happen. Searching for renewal happens every single day of your life and of your ministry, if, if you're in ministry. It's, it's knowing what to expect in your life and what, of your ministry, and then, and then gathering the resources that God has given you to to deal with those, uh, those challenges. Had I even known, very simply, and I'm, like, those of you who are pastors who have, or who have been in, in, you know, in seminary or whatever, some of this stuff will be fairly common to you. However, I want people who are not just pastors to also know this about their pastors and about their leaders, of the kinds of things that their, their leaders are, are being challenged with, because how can our leaders lead us well if uh, unless we also understand the stages in which they're going through. So I, I wish I had known that, that there were stages of a pastor's ministry and that there was something called, I mean, I knew that there was a honeymoon stage. Um, when I was a youth pastor, after eight months, I, I still thought that I was supposed to be on the honeymoon stage. And 
I was very surprised that anybody disagreed with anything I did um, because I was God's gift to this church. Obviously not. Um, so we, uh, we went to the, yeah, number one, honeymoon stage. There we go. Yes. Generally, it's a blank slate, as, as much as a blank slate as you can possibly get, and generally with positive relationships. And for about the first year, they will give you some grace. But after that first year, you go to the next stage, uh, the conflicts and challenges stage. You all of a sudden realize that the church and the pastor are no longer on the exact same page. The, the pastor that you thought was the perfect pastor when he candidated or, you know, or when, when they hired you, uh, all of a sudden the cracks are starting to show and, and maybe not preaching quite the right things or making some changes that you weren't expecting to, them to make and so on. And so these conflicts and challenges happen. And the church and pastors discover that there are differences. And the health of the pastor and the health of the church are key foundations on which to go through and build through this conflict and challenge stage. If, if you are a damaged pastor or if you are a damaged church, how will you get through the conflict and challenging stage? You'll bring out and you'll start acting out the kinds of wounds that you've got or that you had in the past. And, and this stage will become, will, will actually increase rather than, than, than be a normal kind of a give and take stage, which you should expect. If you come into a ministry or if, if you have a pastor or a youth pastor coming into a ministry and you don't have conflicts and challenges by year th two or three, um, then I'd be very surprised. Don't be surprised. These kinds of things are normal, normal parts of the growth uh, experience uh, of the pastor. Years four and five. This is crossroads. When I was pastoring, it was exactly in year four and five, I asked myself every single week, should I stay one more week? I'm going like, do I really need to do this? And, and I kept saying, well, I promised them I'd stay for five years, so I'm gonna stay for five years. But this crossroads period in years four and five of a ministry is often when pastors leave. I quit after five years, exactly. It's usually when, when the conflicts have taken their toll, when you start getting tired, when, when the church starts getting a little tired, when the pastor gets a little tired, and, and that's when, when there's kind of looking for greener pastors at, at times. And um, it can happen for the church, but it can also happen for the pastor. But it's in year five. If you can stay through year five, that's when... That's when the fruit, the bearing fruit can happen. So from years six to 10, that's when the fruit and the harvest come. That's when, if there is trust and love already being built in, in years two, three, four, five, that's when that trust and love will pay off and, and when that renewal will come. And, and it's hard, especially if you're going into a church that's somewhat difficult uh, or if you're, you're, you've had a difficult situation with a pastor, it's, it's hard to, to hang in there till you're five, six, seven. But trust me, uh, and trust others who have, who have studied this to realize that this is exactly when, when the harvest does come. This is when pastors and ministry is at its peak, when, when you understand each other, when you trust each other more, and when, when renewal hopefully happens within your church. However, there is another period. Um, and that is at year 11, there is a second crossroads that happens with a pastor in the church. Um, this, is, this is crossroads part two. And this one can go either way. A pastor or a leader will take one of two paths here in year 11 of their ministry. They will either be reinvigorated after this, this burst of, of fruitfulness in years six to 10, that they'll say, yes, I've got energy and, and I've got vision and there's, there's more left to be done. And they will tackle new challenge, cast new vision, and there will be another season. Uh, there can be another season of a very fruitful ministry. However, if there has been enough battlings and, and so on between years six to 10, 
the pastor may just get tired. Uh, the leader may get tired and say, you know what? I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm just going to coast. And sometimes what a pastor will do is, is then coast for the next number of years and just kind of, especially if they're nearing retirement, um, you know, just, just take it till, till 65 and walk away and become kind of a caretaker, um, caretaker leader. Or they will quit uh, at that time, but, but often they will, they will either be reinvigorated or they will just coast because it's, it's actually a difficult thing to, to move from church to church uh, for leaders. And so why am I saying these things? I, I, I say these for you as you and I as people in churches who are, who are also caring for and, and hoping for and encouraging the renewal of our pastors. Um, know what stage they're in, in their ministry. And you can understand perhaps what struggles or what challenges they're facing so that you can also be a, a strength and encouragement to them in, and, and maybe a sounding board to them as, as they face the various crossroads and, and, and stages in which they're at. So that was kind of a prelim. That's a bonus piece that I hadn't planned on giving you. Um, but I thought it'd be helpful because when I was a young pastor, I wish I had known some of this. I, I might have been, had a bit more perseverance. And now that I've been in the ministry now for 22 years, I'm, I'm in that stage of crossroads two and three and four already. And, and I'm looking for new opportunities for, for fruitful harvest in what I'm doing. And, and I hope and pray that I will not coast and just, just kind of ride it till retirement because that would be well, that's not what Jesus called me to do. Let's look at churches now. Uh, how many of you have churches that are less than five years old? That's what I figured. That's why we have this church planting initiative, right? Um, how many of you have, are in a church right now that is less than 10 years old? Okay, let's try again. Um, how many of you are in a church that is between 20 and 30 years old? So the church would have been formed in the 80s, or 80s, early 90s. Okay, you're getting there. 40 to 60, in the 70s and 60s. Yeah, that's what I was expecting. This is the workshop for you. <laughs> It's churches facing midlife crisis, <laughs> or, or later, <laughs> uh, or looking toward retirement. You know, that's, people keep asking me that. Why do people ask? I'm young. Like, why are you asking? <laughs> I feel a little offended. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about church life cycles. The first, the first couple are irrelevant for us, really, so I can go through them really fast. <laughs> but if you had a church like that, you would know. And again, this isn't just about churches, okay? This is about ministries. At, I, I teach and I do administration at Steinbeck Bible College, and, and every time I start a new program, every time I start a new ministry, it goes through that same life cycle, and, and there's similar challenges and struggles that you face. And, and if you want to get to the next stage and, and bring this, this, this little plant to maturity, whether it's, whether it's a small Bible study group or, a, or an initiative into the community or something like that, these are, these are some pretty natural stages. It doesn't have to be just the whole church that you're talking about, okay? So I'm sure that if, if I were to ask you, so how many of you are in a ministry or have started something that's less than 60 years old, you probably would, you know, some of you would hopefully raise your hands. If you haven't started a new ministry in the last 50 years, I'm surprised that you're even here. Um, because, I, yeah, I have no idea why, you, why your church would even be alive. Because we... we we, we renew and we grow by reproducing and by, by pruning and, and redeveloping. And without that renewal, um, yeah, all you have to do is go through their pockets and look for loose change. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do. It's death. That was a reference to a movie, and if you caught the reference, then that's great. Uh, church life cycle. Let's go through the church life cycle, and I'll try to do this... Uh, relatively quickly uh, because we only need to talk about the 40 to 70s. So birth. Yeah. Then we'll go to growth. Um, and then I'll, I'll break these down a little bit more in detail. So we go from birth, 
zero to five years approximately. This is the scary stage when things could fall apart any time. And you need some really strong leadership to, to get it started. And then you get to the growth stage where the church is, or the ministry is kind of going on its own already a little bit more, and you need different sets of skills and leadership there. Then you get to the stage of stability at about 20 to 30 years, and then you go into the stage of decline between 40 and 60 years. Now, these stages are not legislated. They are not, you don't have to, your church or your organization or your group doesn't have to go here. But if left unattended, this is generally what will happen. And then finally, at around 70 years of age, after about the third generation, uh, the, the original vision is, is gone. And, and if, that, if that third or fourth generation doesn't pick up that original vision, um, then, then it's death. Let's go into the stages in a little bit more detail. Um, and here I, I'm talking about the kind of leadership that's required for, for starting. And here, we're talking about, remember, starting about, talking about churches, ministries, whatever it might be. Um, so hopefully it can apply to, to as many of you as possible here. The birth stage, under five years. This is where somebody has a dream. And EMMC has been amazing at that, where we've had a couple of people <laughs> and who have just kind of had these visions. You know, God is calling me to go here or there. And it's just, it's been amazing how new church plants and so on have just started. And we go like, how did they start? Nobody planned this, you know, in some board meeting or anything. No. It was a D if, you know, Daryl, uh, Kaler is back there, um, he did the discs, uh, you know, the disc study and the, and the D's and the I's. It's the D's and the I's that are running around all over the place planting churches in random places that if, if we were, if, I, if me, I, I'm a C, I think. Um, and so an S or a C, people who like stability and, and everything quite consistent and very analytical, uh, those of us sitting in boardrooms would never plant churches in places like that. It's terribly inefficient. Why are we having churches in such random places? Why don't we put them all close together and we'll be very efficient that way? And no, the D's and the I's, they're, they're usually a founder, they're an evangelist who step out in faith and go and, and people come to faith in Christ and that's amazing. We need people like that. We need more people like that in the EMMC, not less. Um, Interesting, though, that the reasons your church was born will often create the DNA of your church. That is, if your church was born out of a split, that splitting tendency will continue in the new churches as well. If your church was born as a healthy, you know, evangelistic plant, it's amazing how that the flavor and that DNA will also continue in, in the church uh, there on in. And often the size of the church, uh, the, the, the church that starts or the group that starts uh, the size of that group will also influence how, how big that group will get. It's like the kind of seed that you plant in, you know, in the field, that if you have a seed that, that, that's meant to be a big plant or a seed that's meant to be a small plant, there's actually a difference there. And generally, when you plant a church, let's say you start with 50 people, um, then 250 to 500 people is about as much a, of, of plant produce that you will get out of that plant. Uh, so what you start with also influences how, how much you, you continue. So it's the size, but also the flavor or the kind of, of produce that you make in, in that church that will be influenced by your birth. So go back and find out what your church, how was your church born? And see if there's any of those tendencies still in your church from when it was born. It may give you some insight as to what needs to happen to bring renewal to that church. How about going to the growth stage? It's no longer the evangelist and the church planter that's in this stage, or it can be, but the evangelist usually gets uh, fairly restless by about year five. I've known some evangelist church planters, and about year five, they're, they're already looking, for, you know, they're a little ADD um, in, in the best sense of the term. Like, they are, they're very godly ADD people. Um, but, but they're looking for a new opportunity. And that is awesome. Uh, and so in a church like this, the, the young church who has now been imprinted by, by this evangelist usually gets their next pastor. And that is often a pastor, teacher, or someone who can now kind of disciple and, and build up the, the people. Um, it also goes from the evangelist and the, the church planter being the person who kind of calls all the shots to, 
to someone who, who starts discipling others and, and it becomes more of a team uh, situation. At the growth stage, this church also looks for new opportunities. And like Mark Clark, actually, if you just listen to what, uh, the way that he describes the church and the kinds of challenges that they faced, these are the exact kinds of things he was talking about. He said, everybody was coming up to me and saying, here's a new idea of what we should be doing. Let's start a youth group. Let's do this. Let's do that. And, and he says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and at this stage, it's like a young child going like, wow, I can do so many things. You know, like the kid who's in, in soccer and, and dance and in school musical and, you know, and the five or ten other things that we put them into. And, and they're just running ragged because they've got all this act, energy and activity. Well, churches do that as well. And they need a clearer focus. But, but at this stage, they're still trying things. And it's okay to try some things. But after about ten years... It's amazing how the praise and worship songs or the hymns or whatever you started with in year one now has become tradition. It takes about 10 years. And after that, it becomes fairly steady. This is the way we do things now. And it can be the hippest, coolest thing uh, that, that you've started with. And now that becomes the thing that we do. It becomes tradition. So at about 10, 10 years of age, um, a church is typically has been stretched, or the ministry has been stretched fairly far. The, the, the workers are, are doing as much as they can, and there's a need to kind of shift gears again. So we go to the stability stage, stage three. This is the stage of where, where all of the, the hard work in the first number of years, where the fruit starts to come, and, and you don't have to work quite as hard for the fruit anymore. It's like, it's like starting a new, new plot of land. You know, you, you break the hard ground first, and, and the first couple of years, there's, there's just weeds and, and, and all that. But after a while, if you tend it for long enough, eventually, eventually it's, it's actually not that difficult to grow a garden or, or a plot, you know, a, a crop. And it's a bit like that with churches. At about age 20 to 30, churches typically hit their peak. And, and if you just read the histories of your, or read or listen to the history of your church, and I, I'm guessing that the, in the history of your church, it was at about the age of 20 to 30 years of age that your church had its quote-unquote glory days. That's when it was growing, evangelism was happening, and, and outreach, the ministries were in full bloom, and it was, this is when, when, uh, when things were, were really strong. I'm, I'm thinking of my home church, and some of the, the people are in this group are from, from that church. And if you look at it, uh, there, were, there was a peak, especially in, in a certain time period where, at least I felt it was a peak, and it was about the 30 year, the 30 year mark or so um, where, where that church hit its peak, and, and there was kind of a, a sweet spot that happened. And you just want to stay there for as long as you possibly can. This is kind of your vision of renewal. And the people that were teenagers and maybe in their early 20s during that stage when, when things peaked, you go like, okay, I wish I could just bottle this and stay here forever. It becomes the kumbaya moment that you want to just hang on to. And then the song kumbaya, for whatever reason, gets old. <laughs> I didn't know it was possible, but people stop singing it. And it's never, and, and, but every time you get around a campfire, you think, you have to, you, you just, you have to bring out that guitar and play. Some of these people have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> And, and that was my point. <laughs> but when do we... Be, and, and so you're trying to hold on to that kumbaya moment in your church for as long, or your ministry as long as possible, and then it's just like Wally Coyote. I loved him when he was at his prime. Of course, that's a long time ago, too. It shows my age. But he's running over the cliff, and it takes him a while to realize that he's falling off the cliff. He can, he can go to a while. As soon as he looks down, for whatever reason, then he falls. Not before. And it's that kind of an idea, too, that, that we, we feel like we're doing fine. We're doing fine. And the ministry's going well. Everything's stable. Everything's humming. And all of a sudden, the bottom drops out. Some people leave. Or, or the culture changes around us. Or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, people age. And the key, the key people in our church, they're starting to slow down. They can't do it the way they used to do it anymore. And all of a sudden, you look down. The decline stage. 
here is the painful recognition, just like Wile E. Coyote, the painful recognition that I've just run off the cliff and I'm looking down. So, and, and the first thing that we do is we, we try to solve things, which is what we did in stage three. And usually when you solve things in stage three, they get, they get fixed. You know, you can, if, if something goes wrong with a certain ministry, we'll replace, you know, the leader or whatever, and, and you can get by. But now replacing the leader doesn't improve the ministry. There's something else that's wrong. It's something deeper. And then you start trying other things, and they're not working either, and you're looking for that magic answer again. And if the answer doesn't come, you start going like, okay, who can we blame? Somebody must be at fault here. And guess who gets it? Yeah. The board will blame, you know, it, it's perhaps the board or others will blame the pastor for letting old members leave or... Um, the pastor may blame the board for not leading, he, you know, leading them and they're not doing evangelism or they're not tithing properly or, you know, you, you start coming up with, you try to come up with answers to figure out how to, how to solve this thing. The members will, may blame the leaders or the denomination for, for the visitors that come but never return and so they, they can't figure out how to, how to retain people. And of course, the easiest one to blame is the surrounding culture. Because, you know, we'll just blame the world because they're just bad and, and we, can't, we can't minister to them anymore. And they, they don't like things our way. And this is the way God intended it, of course. That's because God intended it the way it was done when we were planted, when we were started. And so as the decline accelerates, the blame also accelerates. Fewer people join. The congregation gets older. You start losing your younger generation. Your under 40s leave under 30s, under 20s, and, and you get a, a remainder of an older church that is just hanging on and hoping that the church building will be open long enough that I can stay here and get my funeral here. People who have been doing many things, I, I'm, I'm going to be a bit depressing for the next while, just letting you know. <laughs> I'm depressing too because with some of you, you're thinking about your churches going, okay, I resonate with some of that, and, and that's also part of it. But if we don't get sad and depressed about the situation, change will not happen. Mark was absolutely right. You have to be desperate. <laughs> Somebody once said recently, I need a vision worth dying for. There has to be a sense of risk and desperation again at this kind of a stage, and and, well, people over 60 generally don't have babies. Only the, the crazy ones do. <laughs> but think about it. It's the same thing with churches. Churches over 60 don't have many babies either. Only the crazy ones do. Because the crazy ones have to take the risk and do an Abraham-Sarah situation. Only God is going to do this thing because we're, well, dried up. <laughs> Can't believe I said that. We'll take that off the video. Okay, so people, let's get back to depression now, please. This is, this is gallows humor here. Uh, so people will then withdraw. Do things that they can control. Okay, you reduce the number of programs. Let's do what we can still handle, what we can maintain. Don't change the worship. Um, resist anything, you know, resist learning about the community around me and, and trying to do something there because we've tried that ministry once before, actually four times before, and it's never worked. So let's, don't bother with that one. And the core members shrink and shrink and shrink until there's just a few people left. That's the decline. And after a while, people realize it's a bit like the, the five stages of death. You know, you have the denial and bargaining and all that stuff. It's a bit like when people die, it's, it's a similar situation when churches do. And so I'll stay on the death stage very short uh, because that's ultra depressing. Uh, but at the death stage, often the pastor becomes an interim. You can't pay a full-time pastor anymore. Um, or they become a caretaker, someone who, who will take care of the church until they, they finally close. 
And often the older people will stay and, and, and try to keep things going and pretend uh, that, that death isn't happening. Um, and that's kind of how it ends. And then after, but but they can, this can drag on for years. I mean, you can have churches dragging on for 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the, in the death watch, and they won't, they won't go. That was depressing. I'll give you a couple of signs of church health. Um, this won't be very long uh, because um, I'd like to focus on I think that, that we, we often get into a stage of decline as a church, and we don't want to acknowledge that, because we, we don't want to be a person who, who kind, of, kind of cries wolf all the time either. And yet, often declines come really, really slowly. Uh, the average church, what is it? Uh, those of you who are, who are reading church books know. Um, it used to be 2% per year, I think it's around 4 to 5, that the average church will lose 4 to 5% of their members or their people every single year. That's just normal. And so if you have a church of, let's say, 100, and you lose 4 people in a year, that's normal. Do the math. How many years will it be till you're 80? But we don't care about numbers. But numbers are people. And people are the ones that God wants to reach through the gospel. And so every person matters. And so as we look at those symptoms, I'm not wanting us to be discouraged or depressed about it. I think we need to be realistic, though, and to realize that renewal will take a work of God in us first to admit that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's how we come to salvation in Christ. Why don't we say that all of us are going to, you know, all of our churches are going to suffer and die eventually, but for the grace of God and his spirit to renew us. Some signs of a healthy church. Our church has been doing the natural church development um, program for the last number of years. Uh, how many of you are familiar with NCD, Natural Church Development? A couple of you? Okay, uh, about a third. Okay, and I'll just give you a, a, a brief rundown of, of the principles, and, but I, I want to come to something that's, I think, just will hopefully give you a, a kind of a, a real clear picture of, of, of where your church is at. This does too. This is more sophisticated than what I'm going to give you in a few minutes. But this is a survey that you can do with about 30 people from your church, and um, you get 30 people, kind of a cross-section, young, middle, old, together, and you ask, they ask a certain number of questions and that talk about eight different characteristics of a healthy church, and they suggest that you need to be good at all eight. Um, I don't know, is, has any church, can you go to the eight, eight ones? Uh, I don't know if any church has been, uh, you know, hit all eight if you've done that. I, I would like to, like, I'd like to talk to you and I'd like to learn how you've done that, but to have, have all eight areas strong. But you can tell whether a church is healthy, and I think NCD does it quite well, when, when they talk about, does your church have empowering leadership? Like, how healthy is your leadership, and how, how much does your leadership involve the people in, in ministry? Uh, Gift-based ministry, Mark talked about that. You know, if you're, if you're just sitting on, on the in your chairs or pews or whatever, and you're not getting involved using your gifts in ministry, uh, then let's get going. Let's find out how we can do that in a healthy way. Uh, passionate spirituality. Uh, how vibrant is your worship? Um, how vibrant is people's relationships with God? Uh, how, how vibrant is the, the spirit, spiritual aspect of our, our worship times? How effective are our structures? Do we have all sorts of boards and committees that kind of block us from doing ministry in an effective way? Sometimes it's just a matter of, of clearing away the rubble and, and allowing people to, to serve. Do we have an inspiring worship service? And inspiring can mean different things to different groups of people. I'm not just saying, oh, you need to have a certain brand of music. No. It's, does that worship inspire faithfulness in the people in your congregation? Don't worry about other congregations. Is it your congregation and the people you're trying to reach? 
does it inspire them to love God and love their neighbor? Holistic small groups. Do people have a place to, to share their lives with each other? Need-oriented evangelism. I dare say that if your church is struggling and in decline, this is probably one of the strongest, one of the areas that, that the survey will show you that, that you're the weakest on. Um, it's one of the hardest ones to deal with. But it, w it will tell you. Need-oriented evangelism. Are we reaching out to people in, in the way that where the gospel can meet them where they're at, what they need? And then also loving relationships. So what's the fellowship level in your church? If you look at these eight, um, and I would encourage you, if, if you haven't done NCD like this, I would encourage you to do that and to get an initial understanding of where your church is at. But also I think, at least what I'm, what I'm seeing is I think NCD is good, but you need somebody outside of your church perhaps to hold you accountable for the, the challenges that you're facing and the changes that you feel God is calling you to make as a result of this survey. Okay, here's the, the checklist. And I want you to, now you'll have to do this in your heads. If you're taking notes, that's fine. Um, it'll be numbers one to 10. Um, but you can, you can certainly do it in the head. Basically, if you answer yes to any question, then count a number, okay? So the higher the number, something will happen. I don't, want to, I, don't, I don't want to cue it in the wrong way. I, you'll probably get it from the first question, but that's okay. First question. Let's go to the health checklist, uh, your church checklist. First question, are there evidences of church decline? That is, does your church show evidences of decline? Now, that could mean decline in attendance, or are your facilities getting dilapidated because you can't afford maybe to keep them up anymore? Um, any ministries that you're stopping because there's not enough volunteers? Um, is there a decline in prayer? Is there a decline in outward focus? Is there a decline in connection with the community? Is there a declining belief in your church that, like, do people in your church still hope, have hope for the church that, that their children and their grandchildren will, will be a part of this church? If, if you want to know where people think about your church, is what was your church like 20 years ago compared to today? Okay, just think about your church and do you see it as, as having grown and been renewed or do you see it as, as having declined? Do you, do you see any signs of erosion? And in fact, like I said earlier, slow erosion is the worst kind because we just get used to it. Okay, evidences of decline. So you have your answer, yes or no? So if, you have, if it's yes, then count one. Okay, next one. Is the past your church's hero? In other words, do your people look at the past for a golden era of the church? Sometime back, way back when, when the church was really the church. This is when we were, this is when we were really ministering. Are there traditions that, that people are holding on to? Do people get angry when you change the practices of the golden age? Um, are there individuals, leaders, or even pastors who frequently mention the church is kind of, eh, it's not quite the same as it used to be? Does your church have a hall of fame uh, you know, that, of, of past events or, or people that, that they keep looking back to? If so, then check yes. Third, does your church refuse, or does your church look different than your community? That's not a good thing. Does your church look different than your community? In other words, if your church is an island of 40 years ago in a community that has changed considerably, that's not a good thing. It could be that there's an ethnic change in your community. There could be um, age change, different kinds of people moving in or out of your community, uh, different social status, um, kind of jobs that people have, and so on. A question you might ask is, would people in your church feel welcome, or would, would people in my community feel welcomed in my church? Would they feel like, yeah, this is, this is home for them? I, I'm still on number three. Are church attenders driving a, increasing distances to come to your church because they've already moved out of the community. 
How many church attenders live in your community? So, yep. Well, if you have too many of that, right. yes, then, then it's, because then you're just parachuting people into, your, into the community, but you're not making an impact in, in the community. Yeah. Now, you have to define what community is for you. As, okay, rural communities, whatever, I mean, they may have to drive a distance to get to your church. That's a different story. That's still your community. So, like, neighborhoods in, in Winnipeg might be different communities or whatever, or, or whatever. Yeah, people driving from Winnipeg to Steinbeck to church. I don't know. It sometimes happens. Um, you know, people driving past several churches to get to yours, that kind of thing. Um, fourth, does your church budget face inward? Meaning, does your budget just feed the people that are inside the church? you know, the programs, the ministries, the staffing, how much of that is turned inward or how much of that is, is looking outward to outreach and ministry? I tried with one church, I tried encouraging them to say, you know, we sh at least 10% of our budget should be involved in evangelism ministry, outreach ministry. And the answer was, no, we shouldn't put any money into evangelism. We should just let people do it themselves. The church practically died. It's not surprising. Your value, your budget, if, if your church doesn't have a mission statement or core values, your budget is your mission statement and your core values. Number five, does your church neglect the Great Commission? There may be methods of outreach that were once used to fulfill the Great Commission, but the methods have been substituted. Now we just do the methods, do the programs, but the Great Commission isn't being fulfilled anymore with, with them. Does that change? If you might be able to do it in terms of we, we support missions elsewhere, but we don't support any support. Right. Supporting missions elsewhere is a good thing. Yeah. But if you're not supporting local missions and local outreach, then you've got half the half the equation. But the reality is we focus locally. Yes. We are focused locally. Yes. How much money do our churches invest in camps and uh mm -hmm. how much do they invest in camps in Moldova? Yes. How much do we invest in camps in Canada or camps in Moldova or whatever? There there is a proportion that goes there. There's there's a lot more invested in Canada, right, Christoph, than than there is in Moldova. Yes. But the same vision that gets people to give to Moldova should be a vision that inspires local outreach as well. It's the Great Commission locally and globally. And sometimes we say, well, we give elsewhere so we don't have to give it as, as much for outreach at home, and I think that's where we miss it. Good point. Next. Six, does your ch church focus on itself? It's, it's very similar to the other one. But basically, do people in the church expect that the church feed them? Should the church feed me and give me the kind of worship experience that I'm looking for, give me the kind of pastoral care that I'm looking for, and so on? Um, you know, whenever people argue about things, length of worship, order of worship, design of the buildings, any of that kind of stuff, we're focusing on ourselves and not focusing on the mission that God has called us to. Does your church focus on itself? Number seven, I'll speed it up now. Uh, does your church have short pastoral stays? If your church has a rotation of pastors, and especially if you can't afford them uh, more, you know, increasingly just can't afford them anymore, that's a symptom of sickness as well. Eight, does your church rarely pray together? I'm not talking about prayers on stage, although that's part of it too, but... What are your prayer times like? What are your prayer meetings like? When people get together and passionately pray about the things that are happening in their community and about seeing God's work being done. Are your prayer times meaningful, intensive, devoted, and bold? Nine, does your church go through the motions? 
Do people understand why they're doing what they're doing? How routine are your meetings? That is your worship times, your, your board meetings, your, your small ministry groups, your fellowship groups, whatever. A church, Tom Rayner, I, by the way, I'm taking these ideas from Tom Rayner's Autopsy of a Deceased Church. I was going to give you that, that name in a bit. Um, and it's a very short book. It's a very depressing book. Um, it'll, you could read it in half an hour. I've given it to you in about an hour. Um, so, but it's, I think it gives you a good summary of, of some of these issues. He says, a church without a gospel-centered purpose is no longer a church at all. I would add simply a club. And finally, 10, does your church focus on facilities? That is, are you more concerned about the quality of the grass or about the junior high ministry that's running across your grass? That really happened in my ministry life. People were upset that the junior high kids who were completely unchurched and needed the gospel were destroying the grass on the front of the church, and I wept. Those are signs that a church is declining or dying. I guess I can't tell you um, how to revive a church because my time is almost up. <laughs> no, I will try. Um, yeah, there's an autopsy of a deceased church. If somebody wants, um, oh, I've got an idea. I think I have a couple of copies of this book still in my office. I think I have about maybe three or four copies. And at the end, I didn't give you any handouts. Um, because you have good memories. And, but if you do want the slides and, and that kind of thing, you can email me. I'll give you my email address. And the first four people to email me, if I have that many copies, as many copies as I'll have, I'll give you those copies uh, of the book. And it's, I think it's a really helpful book. Rayner says that from his research, and he's done a ton of research, especially on, on churches in the U.S., but um, next slide. The... The church health, he says about 10% of the churches in America are what he would consider healthy. 40% of the churches he would consider uh, having six symptoms. They're, they're maybe in the, in the stable area, but they're already starting to, you know, when you're 40, you start feeling a little bit of things here and there, that kind of idea. And about 40%, though, are very sick, while about 10% of the churches are dying. So that's 50% of the churches in America. And I don't think Canada is that much different. In fact, I think we're more advanced, if you want to call it that, at advanced stages of decline than they are. Um, so if half our churches are in this stage, some renewal needs to happen. There's, there's really no choice. Uh, next. A system will never question its fundamental assumptions until the pain induced by present practices becomes intolerable, otherwise known as most guys don't go to the dentist until they can't sleep with the pain. Can you sleep with the pain of a ministry or a church or whatever it might be that is in decline? I think we need to start losing sleep over this one. I think we need to start, and, and I'm not trying to be depressing here, I'm thinking, this is a good thing. Because if we start losing sleep over it and start praying and calling God for renewal, then there's hope. What are some critical interventions? Just a couple. There are three stages at which intervention can happen. Um, whether Just after stability, as things are starting to decline, there's kind of a renewal phase that can happen there. If it goes even further down, maybe 10 years, 15 years down the road, um, what, what these guys call rehab or, um, yeah. And then finally, the at-risk church, the one that's near death, um, sometimes rebirth is the only, the only possibility there. What are, some re so, what are some interventions? The first one, inter renewal. The problem here is decline and we're focused and so on. We already talked about that. Uh, and these are recommendations by Tom Rayner. Uh, for how to start intervening in these kinds of situations. Uh, prayer. Surprise, surprise. Pray that God will help leaders and people to see the opportunities in their community. Take an oddest audit of time, the time members are involved in the church. How, how much time are your members spending just keeping the church going, and how much time are they reaching out? Take a list of every single person you have in your church. 
How are they using their gifts? Is it inside the church or outside? Take an audit of how much the church is spending its money, inside, outside. Make specific plans to minister and engage your community with the gospel. Not easy. This is, these are not quick fixes at all. This is hard, hard stuff that needs accountability and challenge from the outside. Otherwise, it will not get done. I am lazy. And I'm guessing many of us are. We like our comfortable zones. And so we need somebody else to get us uncomfortable so that we aren't part of the problem. You're here. That means that you're interested in the, in the problem and you want to be a part of the solution. That's great. Let's help that to happen then by being accountable to somebody else who can, who can challenge that. Second one, intervention two, going further down. Oh, look at that. Misspelling. Revitalization. Maybe I'm Spanish. I just didn't know it. Um, admit and confess your desperate need for God's renewal. Pray for wisdom and strength to do whatever is necessary. Be willing to change radically. This requires change at a much deeper level. Um, change leads to action and outward focus. Um, one person at least got it. Um, but there is still a difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is still slightly alive, as Miracle Max said in The Princess Bride. Um, what, what Tom Rainer says, though, is mostly dead is mostly dead. And he has actually less hope than Miracle Max does. And I think that we need to wake up and simply call it what it is. Admit our need for God. Admit that we have disconnected ourselves from the gospel, from our communities, from what God has called us to do and be, and to simply repent. And, and it's not, it is not difficult to know what to do. It is extremely difficult to do it. I would dare say that many of our churches are at intervention one or intervention two levels. That's for your leadership and for your people to discern. Uh, find, find out where you think that is and, and then seek ways to, to respond. I'm hoping the conference and, and Daryl and, and Lynn and others can, can help bring some, some wisdom to that, that process as well because I think it's really, it's a team effort here um, as we respond to God in, in, in renewal. And then intervention three, um, yes, death. The options there are to sell the property and give the funds to a new church. You know, a new church plant that may be starting in the community or something like that. Um, or give the building to another church that, that has a relevant ministry in, that, in your community. Um, give the church to people who live in the neighborhood and, and see if some ministry can, can happen there. Or merge with another church and let them lead for a while. They may have more more energy and more, more vision, more hope. Um, again, Miracle Max, with all dead, go through his clothes and look for loose change, um, which is kind of like selling the church building. I did a little exercise recently, and I just, all you have to do, Lou, is uh, just put this on, and we'll leave it at that. I did a little exercise recently where I was, I was looking for vision and renewal for myself, and it was a, I know some of you heard the story, but I was in, in, a, prayer, in a prayer meeting uh, at the college, and I had been at a conference that had talked about 2 Timothy. And they had done an, a study of 2 Timothy right from the beginning to the end, and, and I decided that I needed to go back to 2 Timothy again and, and read it over in kind of that, that's my stage of life right now. And, and so I read it several times, and in 2 Timothy, there were, there were really four things that, that challenged me to, to leave a legacy of, of finishing well, of, of hope, and not of discouragement and decline. The first thing that God seemed to be telling me there in 2 Timothy was to find other Timothys to start mentoring the next generation. Um, 
all of a sudden the name blanked, uh, Osborne. Larry. Larry Osborne says that if, if less than 50% of the people in your church board are, are oh, if less than 50% of the, of the people in your church board or in your leadership team in your church are under 40, then you need to shake things up. Um, yeah, wow. How are we mentoring the younger generation? Now, I realize that some younger generation don't want to sit around boards and, and get bored. They want to do ministry. However that happens, mobilizing young adults in ministry is, is a key thing and, and mentoring them as we've been talking about this weekend. So God seemed to be saying is finding Timothy's, this relational leadership with younger people to mentor them. Um, the second thing God seemed to be saying is to keep the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1, chapter 2 talked about this gospel leadership and focus on the gospel. Don't get sidetracked. Let's not get sidetracked. I think we've been sidetracked for... And, and it's just the way life is sometimes. As you get older, you, you just do things. And after a while, you forget what you're doing. And we need to get back. And I'm, I'm so appreciative of this topic this weekend that, that we're being called to go back to the gospel. Um, it should be a radio program or something, podcast. Oh, yeah, that's right. People don't listen to radio anymore. Um, the third thing God seemed to be saying to me is to be faithful. That is, to be a crisis leader. Um, that's found in 2 Timothy 2 and 3, where it talks about the, the, the conflict between these various groups and people. And so, you know what? Even in the midst of conflict, just stay the course, be faithful, and, and be a crisis leader and, and, and work through it. Survive. And then number four, finish well. This is what I call seasonal leadership. Um, at different seasons of our lives, we're, we're called to do different things. And, and I believe that, that Paul said he had, he had finished the course, he had run, run the race, he had finished well. And I, I call us to do that as well, so that when, we, when, when God looks at us and when we look back at, at the end of our lives, we'll say, you know what, I, I was like Paul, I, I finished well. I didn't, I didn't just get complacent and, and coast with this thing, but I, I was faithful in mentoring new people, and, and I continued to the next generation as faithfully as I could. That's all I have to say. Are there one or two things that, that you've heard said that you want to remember or that you want us as a group to remember or things that you've thought of that, that have kind of piqued your thoughts as we've been talking about birth, growth, decline of, of churches? Are there a few people who just want to give some feedback that way? We can talk about Q&A after. Uh, I'll stay around for the break. But. I read a story recently about this old, old church, too, in Chicago that had, uh, had died or nearly died, and a, a young pastor went into that old church. Was it Christianity Today or something like that? I saw that. Yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, there, I mean, it looked like that's it. And yet that, that whole church and the community was revitalized because somebody new came in with vision and refocused the church on the gospel again. That was fantastic. Yes. Okay, do that. Yes. Uh huh. But you've had several cycles of renewal, though. That's what I like about Glen Cross. But I remember, you know, the church, when I, when I left it in the early 80s, I'm going like, I wonder how many years this, I mean, it's a country church. I mean, 
you have lots of things going against you as far as location and everything, but it's been amazing how God has brought these seasons of renewal in that church. That, that's a, a fantastic example. Yes? Mm. Yeah. Al. Go start something. Honestly, Al. I mean, you, you guys have been doing this. I mean, you. I mean, I'm not. I'm just saying. Over the years, you've had to had to deal with that question several times. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I I don't know if I have real no, wisdom have on that. No, <laughs> so uh, say that again. I didn't quite catch it. The Right, yeah. Yeah. I, I think part of the initial thing is um, who are you wanting to bring in? And if, it's, if we're just inviting other believers there, uh, they don't need to be there anyways. Um, <laughs> honestly, because like, then we're just inviting our friends. Uh, so I, I think the question becomes you know, is, is evangelism a whole part of, of what's really going on. And, and as people are coming to know Christ and they're coming in, those folks will be there. Because the problem is if it's only about church people, and I think I see this regularly. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. And so some folks in our church, so this is, a, yeah, it's always tough when you're telling these stories with folks in your church. But I had a family at one point come to our church and uh, they told me, wow, this is just what we've been looking for. And they, they, gave, they gave me all the reasons. That always makes me a little bit nervous, actually, when people say that. Very nervous. And uh, I was just everything. And about five years later, uh, they were gone. And they sent me an email and said, uh, we're, we're leaving. And they thought, oh, I'd already figured that out. And the reasons they were leaving was almost word for word everything they had told me five years ago. And uh, it took everything in me to not send their email back to them and say, why don't you just hold on to this so that you don't really need to write it next time, five years down the road, you're off to the next church. You can just, but I knew that would be mean. So, uh, I, uh, so anybody in our church, I didn't do that, just so you know. <laughs> but, but I think that's the thing, because if it's only about inviting our own friends who are already Christians, uh, then we're just by giving into the consumeristic mentality. And it's very hard because a lot of times, I don't know what you're thinking about when people, when people talk about the golden era, a lot of times they're talking about, wow, that was great, man. We had like, that's when we had all the kids and all the youth. And every now and then I think, do you know where some of those youth are right now? They haven't been in a church since they graduated from high school. So what was so golden about that? Uh, there's nothing golden about that. Uh, Paul says, actually, run the race. He doesn't say, man, if we can get them through till they're 18, is that ever great? He says, actually, you got to hold on to your faith till you die. And actually, holding on to it till you're 18 is easy. I didn't face much junk in my life till I was 18. Uh, since then, I've been married. And as someone said, like, that's a whole lot of work if you're married. Uh, I've got a son, I've, some of you I've shared that with, who has a very weird neurological disorder. He's down and out of it again right now. My, my wife's not here because she's home looking after him. Uh, I've had, you know, I'm in a great church, but it's come with some tough battles. I didn't face any of those battles before I was 18. Um, and so I think sometimes we need to realize the golden era is only golden if actually folks are really equipped to, are, they, are they still holding on to the faith 30 years later? So I, I think, I don't know if that answers any of it, but I think let's look at whether or not it's just about inviting our friends or whether or not there's real evangelism going on. Church growth is not necessarily numbers from other churches. Church growth is people coming to know Jesus 
and then the churches grow. So let's always make sure even the new people we have coming, that we're excited that they're folks that are, I've got a, a guy at our church right now, he's not at our church actually, he's come to a Christianity Explorer. I got to know him years ago through our sons playing hockey together. That's what excites me because he's in Christianity Explored this week year because about every five years he realizes he can't do life anymore and, and it's, it's collapsing on him and, and all of a sudden, you know, now he's, you know, we're hanging out again and he's saying, man, how, you got something that I don't got. I need to know what that is. And so that comes back to if the gospel, the things we've talked about this weekend is not at the heart of who we are as a church, then we are just a bit of a club. So th those are some thoughts. I don't know if that helps. Thanks. Lou, could you just forward just a, a bit till the end, just with my uh, email address on there? Oh, that's not my email address, but that's okay. Yeah, so you won't get the book because you don't know my email address. And I can still keep it. It's awesome. Come and talk to me afterwards. Yeah. T. Hebert at sbcollege.ca. There we go.